Hi class. In this class, we will find out, for example, if we having an operation, a coffee shop. So in the coffee shop, somebody, the owner comes to you and says, well, let me see if, uh, when can I uh, have my coffee shop is open and when do you think I should close my coffee shop for a rest? So here today, we will be looking at this option. So you wonder sometimes why a Starbucks is not open, for example, 24 hours or some restaurant is not open 24 hours, but on the same time you find out some Tim Horton store, Tim Horton places that are open for 24 hours. So when can we have our operation open at what time we should close it? So uh, this is one of the example we can look at it. Uh, this is also applicable for uh, firms, any firm. And when we're talking about firms, we're talking about uh, any store that operates at the profitable level. So let's start the chapter. So in, in this chapter, the beginning, as we said, eventually we will be looking at how uh, the business should behave during certain times, certain hours, or certain days. But we, not, we need to understand some other uh, information like the perfect competition, the other type of uh, market, <clears throat> and the other type of market. So in chapter eight, we'll be talking about the perfect competition. And here will be also, uh, we distinguish among a firm industry and a market. And we need to explain what is meant by perfect competition and market system and use the two approaches to explain how a firm might maximize its profit. When we talk about firm, once again, we're talking about store or company or a manufacturing place. They are all considered in economic terms, they are a firm. And also we're gonna learn uh, and explain what is meant by a break even point or a break even price and shut down price and explain how a firm cur uh, supply curve is derived and explain the effect of the change in the market demand and market supply on both the industry, the whole industry and the firm. Now, when we're talking about industry here, we talk about a group of producers, uh, oil producers, uh, wheat producers, they are industry itself. And then a market is the interaction of both producers and the consumers. So there is a different market in, in we look at it and <clears throat> we look at it from uh, the, whether it's identical products, or differentiated products. And we also look in this case, if it's identical, whether it's a one firm is providing it, many firms or a few firms. So in the case of, uh, if we have an identical product or products is similar and we have many firms are producing it, is we call it a perfect competition. So nobody, it's everybody produced the same red apple and uh, everybody buying the same red apple. That's a, a perfect competition. Now, if it's an identical product, but in a few firms, so that's what you call um, uh, undifferentiated oligopolies because undifferentiated because the product is the same or red apple, 
but a few firms is running this business. And then if you have identical product and one firm is running it, is that what you call a monopoly? We'll bring some examples on the next uh, slide. When the product is differentiated, like a red apple, green apple, mixed for apple, so they are and run, and there is in the market only, may, there are many firms. So what do you call is a monopolistic competition? It's just like a McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's, these are uh, monopolistic competition because all offers a fast food. Uh, then if you have a differentiated uh, products, yet uh, a few firms involved in it is called differentiated oligopoly. Let's look at that example to make it easier for you to understand. In a case of perfect competition, and we said in the perfect competition, there is a numerous sellers, there is undifferentiated product, so the result what happened is it easy to enter market and sellers has no price control. So if his price is a little bit higher, he's out. Somebody else will replace him. In a case of uh, monopolistic competition, the number of sellers are many. So there is a lots of sellers are there and uh, type of product is differentiated. Uh, and also, because it's a monopolistic competition, um, it's easy of market entries, so they can establish their own monopolistic. And uh, the seller price control is low. A good example, you look at the OPEC, which is they are made of countries, but they're controlling the price of oil. And then you have other big producing like the Russian Federation that also have a, a oil uh, produ production. And they are running a monopolistic, both of them are monopolistic uh, competition. Now, in this case where we have, in general, uh, a few sellers and undifferentiated uh, product and a difficult entry market, and it's moderated, the price control moderated, it's called oligopoly uh, undifferentiated. And then you have the oligopoly differentiated is usually a few sellers and uh, the product is a little bit differentiated, which is you have uh, a high-end oil, clean oil, uh, and non-clean oil, a little bit differentiated. And here where it is, it's difficult to enter and substantial. And the last one, one provider, the type of product is unique, very difficult to enter and substantial. So when it comes to um, oligopoly and the monopoly is, we notice one thing is the fact it's difficult to enter, definitely. And the producers number of sellers has to be a few or one. And the others is could be perfect numerous is a more than many. And in the monopolistic competition is many. Now, as an example, if you look at a perfect competition, like the wheat, so you can buy the wheat from Canada, from USA, from Australia, from uh, New Zealand, uh, from India. This is a perfect competition. And then you have the monopolistic uh, competition like convenience stores, 7 uh, Eleven, uh, Max, uh, or the restaurant themselves. And then you have uh, like a oligopoly, but 
undifferentiated, like the oil refinery, not the oil produce oil refinery, because they all produce the same oil or lumber, the one who cut the uh, thing. And you have the oligopolies, uh, but it's differentiated like automobile. So Honda different than uh, Ford, different than GM, but they all produce cars or soft drink like a Coke versus Sprite versus Pepsi. And the Pepsi produce certain like, I think it's a Sprite and rest of them and Coke produce Coke and rest of them. And then you have the perfect uh, monopoly, which is the public, uh, it usually in the field of public utilities, cables could be an internet provider, these are uh, a telco company could be, these are monopoly, uh, public utility, uh, monopoly case. Now, um, just a general understanding. So in what type of market you will find the following types of firms and product. Hairdressing salons as a monopolistic competition because there is a major ones who does provide, there is the small ones, but it's not a perfect, the major ones like ultra cut and uh, uh, there's another one called hairstyle or something. They are monopolistic competition. Then you have the industrial chemical in Canada. Uh, it is undifferentiated uh, oligopolies. It's like a, um, you know, it's a chemical. So it's a basic thing used for other product products probably for our services. And then you have the brewers, you know, you have different beer. So they are differentiated light beers or uh, regular beer in different companies. So they are differentiated oligopolies. And then you have a world market uh, for coffee and it's a perfect competition, just like the wheat. And you have Rogers Cables, which is the, in Ontario, they have the monopoly because they had, they put all the fiber optics and towers. So nobody is allowed to put their fiber optic. They can print other companies renting from them, but they don't have the, you know, uh, they don't have any competition. So in a perfect competition, uh, a market in which all buyers and sellers are price takers. So is according, you know, everybody is has no control over price. And in a perfect competition, the condition is you have a many uh, small buyers and sellers, no preferences shown, easy entry and exit by both buyers and sellers and the same market information available to all. So let's see sometimes the stock market is could be a perfect competition and sometimes it's not in what way in the stock market a good example of perfect competition and in what ways it is a bad example it's a good example if many millions of buyers and sellers there comes in and buys everything and everybody sells things a product sold the shares within the company. They're all similar, are all homogeneous. Uh, you have 100,000 shares, which is all similar. And then you have a great data of information available about product. But in what way it's a bad example? It is when some buyers and sellers are big enough to affect the prices and uh, if there is no equal access to the information, there is inside trading is happening, inside information is happening, and there is no, not free entries into the market. You need to hire to hire a broker. So you might have to uh, stock a market. One has these uh, specifications, these three specifications. And that makes it a good stock market. Another stock market who has these specifications that make it a bad sample. So you run it against the qualifications and then 
according to you drive the understanding whether it's a perfect competition or not. Now, <clears throat> so here what we're looking at, we're looking at competitive uh, or competition in the industry versus the firm. Now, in a pure competition, a single firm has a little effect on overall supply, so the demand is constant. So they cannot, you know, if you produce less, the another firm comes in and produce as what's pending. If you produce a lot, you have to cut down. So uh, the demand is horizontal and the firm is a price taker. That's in the perfect competition. We said there is lots of small firms and lots of uh, buyers for the product. So in, in, in general, this is in uh, industry. As you see, the supply is, and of demand is a regular curve. So it's like a supply and demand for the market here. But if you look at it from a firm point of view, because a firm is a price taker, it's not determining the price. So the price is at $20 and the demand is if you're increasing it, you will lose, you're not gonna do any business, decrease it, you will lose, you're not gonna do any business. So there is, you know, it is a constant demand for per, per, uh, quantities, it's at $20. So you have no control over it. In the industry, no, it's a different where, you know, uh, as demand shift out or shift in, supply shift out, shift in, that's the whole industry. That's on the firm level is constant. But here where we start wondering and see how we can in, understand and break down of different uh, economic, uh, terminology within the business, within the firm, in order to analyze uh, the situation of the market. Now, first we need to know what's the total revenue, which is the total revenue is equal with the, is the total quantity sold multiplied by the price. That's a straightforward. So the TR is equal with the Q quantity output multiply by the price. We'll be using more terminology, so you just gonna remember these terminology. So the total revenue or TR is equal to Q multiplied by P. And the average revenue is the amount of a revenue received per unit sold. So if I'm selling a hundred units uh, at, uh, say $100, my average revenue per unit sold is $1. If I'm selling 100 units at $1,000, my average revenue per unit sold is at $10. So the average revenue or the AR is equal with the total revenue. We said like if I'm selling 100 or I'm selling 1,000. So the total revenue, whether I'm making $100 or $1,000, divided by the number of the quantity here, Q. And if we look at the total revenue, we said here, we'll bring this the Q multiplied by P over the Q. So if we cancel this Q and this Q, which is always same amount, then we have the price remaining. And the price remaining, which is the price is equal with the average revenue. In other words, so, if we are selling one unit, $20, our average revenue per unit is a $20. If we're selling two units, which is $40, our average revenue is a $40. The other thing that we need to understand beside the average revenue and the total revenue, we need to look at the marginal revenue. So if we are selling one more product, how much we are making. And we brought the example saying, if we sell one unit, I'm making $20. If I'm selling two units, I'm making an extra $20. Three units, I'm making extra $20. 
if I'm selling each unit at $20. So the extra revenue derived from one more unit is the marginal revenue. And the marginal revenue is usually the change in your total revenue divided by the change of total quantity. So if I'm selling one quantity at $20, my total revenue is only $20. Then I'm selling two quantities at uh, becomes my total revenue is $40. So the change in the total revenue uh, it's $20, 40 minus 20. The change in quantity, two minus one, becomes one. So the total my marginal revenue is the extra revenue derived from one more unit. Now, if we look again in the, uh, this, uh, we see that the, more, the total revenue is made of what? The change in the quantity multiplied by the price. Keep in mind, here the price is fixed, so you know you're not changing the price. Divided by total revenues, if we break down the two, the changes of the total revenue, it's made of changes of quantity multiplied by price, changes of quantity. Once again, we take out these two, becomes a price equal with the marginal revenue. So what we notice here, the average revenue is equal with the price and the marginal revenue is equal with the price, means the average revenue and the marginal revenue and the price, they're always equal with each other. So average revenue and marginal revenue and the price are equal. This is only an example. And here to make it more clear for you is if your output is zero, your price, I mean, you have your pricing your product is at $20, but it's a close, your store is closed. You haven't opened it. It's 8.30 and you open at nine o'clock. So you're, you're, you have, uh, nobody's buying, but your price is at 20. Your total revenue, because it's a close, is a zero. Your average revenue, you're not making anything. So it's zero and your margin, because you're not selling anything is zero. But as you open the store and people are buying, when you sell the first unit, your unit's always at $20 that you sold. So to calculate your total revenue is simply by multiplying the price into the quantity. So three multiplied by two is $60. So we are aware of how much is our total revenue. Now we need to see our average revenue. Our average revenue, keep, we keep as, long, as much as we are selling, we said the differences, so it's a constant 20. And <clears throat> the marginal revenue that we generated is also constant 20. And because we came up with rivet, we drove this understanding from uh, price equal average revenue and marginal revenue. And that's in for the competitive firms which is they are a price taker. They are not a price makers. So everybody has the same prices and uh, you know entries and exits, it's the same thing. So always the price equal with the average revenue equal with the marginal revenue. Now, the total revenue slopes up, more units are sold. So the more you're selling, the total revenue keeps going up. So you're selling uh, uh, one unit, two unit, four unit, and the revenue is keeps going up. So the total revenue is up. But as a firm, the total average and marginal revenue we said is stays constant. So if you notice here, this and this and this stays constant. As we said, the price equal with the uh, average revenue equal with the marginal revenue. So here, it stays constant. So you pay, sell one coffee at $1, two coffees at $40, but each one is a 2020. Three coffees at $60 total revenue, but each one 20, 20, 20. So really the average revenue and the marginal revenue is equal, but it's a driven by the demand because we said that the supply has no control over the prices 
and the, the demand has no control is a perfect competition here. So how we calculate the profit, and you know, is a regular, we do the total, uh, the difference between the total revenue uh, and the total cost. So the total revenue, total profit is equal with the total revenue minus total cost. When do we know we have a break even output? The level of output at which the sales revenue of the firm just cover the fixed and the variable cost, including the normal profit. So in other words, let's say I'm selling two units, which is at uh, $40. I know my fixed cost is $10. My variable cost is uh, another $10. And my manpower, which is me working there, which is a normal part of the normal profit or normal uh, implicit and explicit, we talked about the economic accounting, another 20. So 10 plus 10 plus 20 is a 40. And that 40 is equal with the level of output, which is two coffees equal with 40. That's a very expensive coffee, $20 an hour, but that's okay uh, per one, uh, $20. But this is an, only an example to see it when, when I'm doing a break even <clears throat> is basically when I'm calculating my explicit and implicit cost and equal with the, my total sales or total output or total revenue. So the total revenue or the total cost and profit is only an example. So when my output is zero and I have the price of my coffee at $20, so my total revenue, you notice here, I'm not selling anything. So I'm making a zero total revenue. But I do have to pay the rent. I do have a, a, an office manager, which is, is a fixed cost, not the employees. The office manager, the one who runs the business is a fixed cost. The rent is a fixed cost every month, whether I'm operating or not is a fixed cost. So here, because I'm paying you know, my total cost minus my total revenue because zero is a minus 30. Now, as my output or sales start increasing, when we talk output, that include maybe sales in this, you know, but there is a demand for it, to put it this way. So I keep my price, which is equal with my average uh, revenue, goes with, equal with my uh, marginal revenue, it stays, you know, we know that is a $20. As the output increase, my total revenue is the increase and my total cost is also increasing. And why is it increasing here is because during the, my total cost, when it's now working, there is only rent I'm paying. But when I'm running a business, I'm bringing an employee, which is that I'm paying him a salary. That's called a variable cost. I'm running electricities, having the lights on, and that's a variable cost. I'm bringing weed or a coffee beans to make a coffee. That's a variable cost. So my total cost is my fixed cost plus the add on the variable cost, which is we notice here, as you start producing or the output, your total cost from $30, which is a fixed cost, $30 plus, zero variable cost. Now you have a $30 stays a fixed cost of rent plus $18 per every unit you're producing, it keeps increasing. So your total revenue is a 20 and your total cost made of, made of a fixed cost, total fixed cost plus total, revenue, total variable cost. You subtract this from this, you end up with your minus 28. And as you produce more, the cost is coming down 
the total cost comes on down because your total revenue uh, it's getting higher and your total fixed cost is getting lower. And eventually, at the, when you produce a three unit, you will have total revenue is 60. How come? Because the 20 multiplied by three is 60. So that's your total revenue. Now you have a $30, your total cost, plus a $30, your total revenue. So your total profit is zero. That's when you do, in a way, a break even. But <clears throat> when you can maximize your profit is that's where you, they say, let's put a target sales. When you are making six units and here when your total revenue becomes at 120, 20 multiplied by six is 120, minus your total cost, which is you're making a profit. Here is you are maximizing uh, your uh, total profit. But if you notice here, you have as your total profit is here is a 30 and your total profit here is a 30. We will explain in what's the difference between these two. So you are looking at your cost, although you're increasing your cost by how much 20 and you're increasing your cost by two, a 20 revenue. And this is where you have the real, uh, you know, uh, productions where you start making the two points where you're making the maximize your profit. And uh, as a startup, and in the beginning, we will look at the graph once you see it. And it's the graph it shows here, the total revenue, the cost versus the profit. And if you notice here, we start going through, if we look at the first part, this is the first part. Now, producing less than three units or more than eight result in a loss. So as your total revenue, you so it's, you know, um, as we started, we said that your fixed cost, uh, I mean, total cost is made of your fixed cost and variable cost, total fixed cost and total variable cost. And you notice that we said that in your total fixed cost, as you start the business, it's just your fixed cost, which is rent or uh, general manager. So here, when you start at the output of zero, you have a fixed cost. As you're producing, your total revenue keep going up, and also, but your total fixed cost, your total uh, cost, it keeps declining. Is because your production is coming, uh, you know, you start producing. So your your um, <clears throat> The, the numbers is increase is less and less. And here at this point where you have something called uh, a break even. So you do a break even at the three units where your total revenue and total cost is equal. And also you do another break even at uh, eight units, which is your total revenue and total cost is also equal. And actually the gap between the total cost, which is this one and total revenue at the highest point is where you maximize your profit. Now we notice as you are not producing, you're below the cost. So it keeps you start producing, making some, covering up your, your costs or your loss, you can start, then you go to a break even point, which is a three, and then you keep making a profit. And the highest point here is when you make 6.66, 6, which is the same idea here. So at the six, where you make the most profit. Now let's see, here at when you make five, 
So when you make five, the difference between this part and this part, or this part and this part is less than the difference between this part and this part, so zero six is the peak here on the graph. So your break even occurs at three and eight. Here, producing less than three units or more than un units result in losses. If you notice here, losses, and here is losses. Break even occurs at three or eight. To maximize profit occurs when the distance between total revenue and total cost is the highest. And you need to have the maximizing your profit is always when the total revenue is the, the uh, higher than the total cost. So at this point is where you have this total revenue is the highest than this graph down there, the total cost. Now, so here, once again, we look at, you know, more deeper in this information and we have the output and we have the total cost. We have what you call the marginal cost, the extra cost if you, when you are producing one more unit and you have the marginal revenue, the extra revenue uh, increase when you're selling one more unit. And then you have the marginal surplus or the deficit which is the difference between these uh, marginal cost and marginal revenue. And then you drive the total profit or loss from uh, total revenue minus the total cost. At zero, you have to pay fixed costs, but you're not producing anything. So there is no extra cost, only you pay the fixed cost and you're not selling anything. So there is no extra revenues coming in. And the marginal, which is this minus this is zero. Zero minus zero is zero. And your profit, because you have to pay rent and you're not making anything. So you have to loss over 30. Now, when you are starting producing output one unit, so your total cost, is gonna be your fixed cost plus the variable or the marginal. And the marginal here is 18. So you have 18 plus 30, which is 48, or the, your variable cost, which is eight. It's the extra cost that you cured for producing one more unit. And suddenly you're selling at the $20. So your marginal surplus 20 minus 18 is a 20, but still you're in a loss because why is that? Because you have a 48 uh, cost, which is made of revenue plus, I mean, uh, your fixed cost plus your marginal cost. And you sold only $20 one unit. So you have minus 28. And as you produce more, we know that your marginal cost start going down because your production is more and your marginal revenue keeps going up because you're still gonna make that $20, but the difference between marginal cost and marginal revenue is gonna go up and up until you reach to uh, total profit is zero. And here where you are into a break even, so you notice also here at three and eight, you are in a break even. You're not taking money home. Here, when you are in the six, where your marginal surplus, see, you keep producing until it has to reach zero. So once it's reached zero, that if you produce more, you're gonna lose. And if you produce less, you have an opportunity lost. So once it's the marginal, the difference between the marginal cost and marginal revenue or the marginal surplus deficit, which is that's what you call is zero, that's when you are at the maximum production. So when you have a coffee shop, you calculate what's the marginal revenues, what's the marginal cost, and then 
will you notice that the marginal cost and marginal revenue is at the maximum and you start going into negative, then when you shut down, actually. So this is our, your break even, you're maximizing your profit. Uh, I'm sorry, you're maximizing your profit. But sometimes what's happened, you keep operating even if you're not having maximized your profit because you need to cover what? The basic cost. You say, okay, if I close it, I'm losing $30. But if I'm operating, I'm gonna lose you know, uh, $20. So I keep operating, not closing it because in the end, I'm gonna lose only $20 instead of more. So we, we came to the example saying we produce 60 at the total cost of 90. And you know, we're selling at $20 each unit. So six multiple 20 is 120 or total revenue, for example. And 120 minus 90, we said is at 30. Now, as we sell more unit, each unit will be making $20. So when it's more marginal cost and marginal revenue becomes zero, then we are at the maximum profit. But we are not always in the operation in a firm. We trying to said we said we're trying to maximize the profit. We can the second thing, if we cannot maximize the profit, we can minimize the, the loss. And this is where we look at in operation how we can minimize the loss. So here, as the marginal cost keep produ uh, producing, uh, reducing, as it's compete, uh, increasing, start increasing, we have where the marginal cost equal with the average revenue, equal with the price, equal with the marginal cost, that's where we are in a total profit is maximized. So whenever the marginal revenue, which is this one, equal with the marginal cost, that's when we are at the uh, uh, maximizing the profit. So in other words, when can we open, keep working and when we stop working? So if the marginal revenue is more than the marginal cost, so if it's at this level here, which is the marginal cost we notice is lower than the marginal revenue, then we produce more and more. As we going higher than here, which is the marginal cost becomes from here, start going higher, then we need to produce less and less. So the only, the perfect uh, profit, when we maximize our profit is when we said, when a marginal revenue equal with the marginal cost. So to maximize the total profit is we need to produce where our marginal revenue from selling one unit is equal with our marginal cost. And that's where we are maximizing uh, the total profit. Now, <clears throat> so we noticed we spoke about the break even and we spoke about uh, profit maximization. And here what we're talking about, knowing that the maximum uh, profit at the marginal revenue equal with the marginal cost. So here's what we have. We have the marginal revenue equal with the marginal cost. So you notice here it's going up. So this is where we are maximizing our profit at the six unit producing and of output. And the price is at $20, which is average revenue. 
okay? Average revenue, marginal revenue, and the price, there are one different faces for the same number. But at this point, where the marginal revenue equal with the price, equal with the average revenue, equal with the marginal uh, cost, we can see that. So the average profit per unit is, you know, the average revenue minus the average cost, because we say the total profit is equal with the total revenue minus the total cost. So the average revenue profit is the average revenue minus the average cost, which is a 20 minus 15 is 15. So here we are, our cost is 15 and we're selling it at 20. But what's our total profit? It comes in from the total, uh, the average price multiplied by the total quantity, which is $30. So your total profit is shaded in the this blue area, in this area. Okay, from here to here. This is your cost and this is your profit. And then we said in there, there is two breaking even point at three units and eight units. And we said the best place to maximize our profit is when marginal revenue equal with the marginal cost. Now, we, in the previous chapter, we spoke about economic and normal profit, explicit, implicit costing. And we said, when you do accounting, regular accounting, you do only explicit costing is what money goes to the third party for the landlord, for the electricity, for paying your rent, for the employees you're hiring. But there is a, a other cost that we're not doing it in the accounting approach, uh, it is the, the things that I'm working there. Uh, there is, you know, there's also cost in it, but we're not taking it into the accounting. Um, for example, if, I, if I'm a, 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 a cleaner, I say I make $30,000 a year, but I'm opening my business, this is an opportunity cost of the 30,000 that I'm not making outside, but I'm not running a salary for me. If I'm a doctor, I might be making 150 or $200,000. So it is different. We need to take into that in, in order to do the economic calculation and economic accounting, which is economic profit. So economic profit, it is the profit of an entity achieved after accounting the both, the implicit and the explicit. And the normal profit occurs when the economic profit is zero. Or the, alternatively, when the revenue equal explicit and implicit costs. So say I'm running a coffee shop and I'm a doctor, I supposed to be making 150,000, but I am a doctor not going to my, not doing my job, which is as a doctor. So I have 150,000 uh, opportunity lost here. We keep it on the side. Now we, we do, we do a calculation and I'm making 500,000 from making this coffee, not running any salaries for me, or this $500,000, is usually $300,000 or $400,000 is my total, my cost. So 500 minus $400,000, my accounting, regular accounting is really is a 100,000. But when I'm bringing the implicit cost, which is 150,000 as a doctor, then I'm losing $50,000 here. So the normal profit occurs when the profit is zero or alternatively, when the revenue equal with implicit and explicit cost. Now, so here where we saw looking at break even and shutdown. 
the price, the break-even price is the price at which a firm makes only normal profit that is make a zero economic a profit. So not accounting here, we do economics profit, which is implicit cost, explicit cost, mine, total revenue minus implicit cost and explicit profit. So as long as the loss from production are less than fixed costs, the firm should continue to produce. I will explain that in the graph. This means that the firm should produce as long as its total revenue equal to the two or greater than total variable cost. So your total revenue keep producing more higher than your total variable cost. You keep producing. Maybe you are in a level of losing, but not uh, you covering your fixed cost. In the shutdown is the price that is the firm sufficient to cover a firm's variable cost. This is when you tell the coffee owners, this is when you're supposed to close your coffee at what time. So to explain that more. Now, we have two issues. One issue is a break even. And this level is the break even price. And this level is the shutdown. What's the difference? The difference is here. At this level, or before it, we notice that the average price is higher than uh, the price itself, I'm sorry, is higher than your average price. And that's when you start to keep producing. But once it goes, your price is lower than average, then when you do a shutdown. So anything above your average price, this one, you keep producing of your prices. Anything, what it goes below this average price, which is could be here, any point here, that's when you shut down. So at $8, you close your coffee shop uh, because you are only selling what? You're selling five, uh, four units or three units or two units. As more the price is at $14, that's when you keep uh, selling more. So the minimum break even price is where the total cost is the lowest. That's when you do a break even price. So your total cost is the lowest. The firm shut down if the price fall beyond the average cost. So when I'm keep operating is when, when my, I, I am above the average cost. When I'm stopping is when I'm below the average cost. That it's a different when we're talking a, a profitable or non-profitable. As the whole idea is we are operating to maximize our profit. But once we, we are not maximizing our profit, the next thing we're looking at, how to minimize our loss. And our loss, when it thinks, goes below the average variable cost. In other words, if I'm bringing a guy to produce five coffees because he's charging me $20 an hour, which is he has to uh, do four, uh, $4 a coffee. And suddenly I see him, he is only able to produce three or two or one. There when I see a bringing a guy, hiring him and he is, and considered to be an average variable and a variable cost for me. And I see he's producing less than four, then when I'm closing. So the minimum break even price is the average total cost is the lowest. The firm shut down 
if the if price falls below the average variable cost minimum as we notice that so when you are shutting down you need to know that you are shutting down anytime below the average variable cost and as you hear what's happening here you are doing a break even at this point now we jump to another issue that we need to look at it also is the fact that industry demand and supply. We looked at the firm's demand and supply and we said that the firm's, uh, you know, different than industry. In the short run, the size of both the firm and the industries are fixed. That's in the short run. But in the long run, both are variable. What is that? In a, in a short run, the firm, the size of the firm is fixed. In the short run, the number of firms is also fixed because the capacity of the industry is fixed. You cannot adjust in the two minutes to meet the demand. But in the long run, the size can vary and the firm can go bigger and smaller. The number of the firms can also vary according to the demand. The capacity of industry also in general can vary. Now, let's look at this example, how this affects on a firms and effect on industry, the whole industry. So let's say at the initial point where D1 and S1 at the point A, that's the equilibrium. So suddenly, we have an increase in demand, not increase in supply, increase in demand. So we notice the price keeps going up, went up. And as in a short run, an increase in demand increased the price to a B. There's not much supply, but the prices is keep increasing. So the price is going higher. And then in the long run, we see an adjustment because you suddenly there's more profit. We know from the early chapters that there would be a shift out in the supply, more suppliers coming in in the market. So uh, uh, that's what really has happened. And that shift causing the move to the point B to a point C. The long run, the new firm in the firm that increasing supply is returning to the price C. So again, it goes back to the C. And we notice here what's happened to the firm. The price went up and then went down, down the increase in the price and output is only a temporary in the firms. In, in the industries, the price goes back to the C. Now the effect of a, a decrease in demand here is an increase. A decrease in demand, what will happen? We notice that uh, the first thing is gonna happen, decrease in demand shift in, and not the price shift in, which we spoke about it, and the difference between uh, why things is a, a decrease in demand is different than the prices within. As it shift in, the price becomes a what? at equilibrium point of initial work was a P1 and the demand shift in becomes a B1. As then we notice because the prices went down, there is less suppliers, people getting out, the supplies getting out and the supplies will shift in and goes back to the same price of equilibrium. So the prices did not change the quantity of just reduced. So the industry now has a lower output at the C point, but the firm output return again to the regular, which is uh, its point back again. Now, keep in mind, in the long run supply of industry, increasing costs 
uh, industry. If the price of resource and producer both raises as the industry expands, the result is an increasing cost of the industries. So if the price of resources and products both increases as the industry expand, and we know that industry will be expanding according to the shift out of the demand. But there is a decreasing cost industry if the price of resources and pro product both fall as the industry expand. So there is a decrease cost of the industry causing it or vice versa. And then you have a constant cost industry if the price of resource and product remain unchanged as the industry expand. So if you notice, there's more stores around and the price is there, it's because the industry cost is lowering and they're making more profit. So there is more suppliers there. So the concept to remember in the end is the difference between a firm and industry and a market. And we notice we spoke about monopoly, oligopolies, all these things. And then we now just we finished talking about industry versus the firm, what happens and the source of the perfect. And also we, we need uh, the concept to remember the source of perfect competition and the market system, how firm maximizes profit. We talked about the break even and the shutdown. And we talked about a firm supply curve from, from the marginal costs of course. And also we spoke about the impact of the change in the demand and our supplies on the firms and the industry, the last slide. So uh, this is the end of the uh, chapter. <clears throat>